I uh, have the dubious honor of going first. I don't say dubious honor, the honor of going first, but basically out of logistical uh, of logistics and not changing laptops. It was a challenge this year with the hybrid to figure out, you know, we wanted to do things in chronological order, but also sort of deal with the online versus virtual, and then also the, the opening. So I, so I get the honor of going first. And I have so many things that I could share about my uh, time with Dan, both uh, uh, as a graduate student, but also uh, the impact that his work has had on my uh, entire uh, life. Um, um, but I'll try to keep it brief, and then uh, we'll hear some words from um, Lewis and Al and Clark before we have a coffee break, and then we'll have a second morning session uh, after that. So um, this is me at my PhD defense uh, with Dan um, wondering uh, well, how on earth I got this far. Uh, and this is uh, where I worked at University of Michigan in the uh, Advanced Technology Lab uh, all those years ago. And I'm sorry, Dan, that I was not always, oh, is it not showing the screen? Yeah, there we go. I'm, I was not always the sharpest tool in the shed. Uh, here's me testing a cardboard version of Rex with an oscilloscope. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what I was doing there. Um, I, I honestly don't remember this picture, but it came up in the, in the best script. Um, and you took me as a graduate student. So uh, the first vignette that I want to give is one about phase and phase regulation. So um, for those that don't know, I, you know, sometimes people ask, you know, Noah, since you do a lot of neuroscientists, are you a scientist, but you also do some robotics? You know, are you an engineer? And uh, you know, really the answer is neither. Oh, great. I'm an uncoordinated juggler. <laughs> it's all part of the act. Okay, good. I thought I was going to have to solve some Rob Greist style topology there to figure that one out. Uh, so I'm a juggler, and I got my start studying the relationship of phase between objects in a very practical setting uh, in uh, middle school and high school. And uh, um, everything from thinking about how to regulate sort of separate dynamical systems that kind of can come in and out of phase with each other and interact with each other in interesting ways. Um, the coupling of, uh, um, you know, the coupling of oscillators between multiple people that are juggling, the sequencing of tricks, such as, uh, which I th then later learned about something called sequential composition, but jugglers already knew about this because if you want to throw behind the back, it's kind of hard if you don't profess pre have a trick beforehand, which is a high throw with your left hand. So um, uh, there's uh, so many concepts that I kind of gained a practical mastery of as a kid. <laughs> I got the opportunity to really see how deep that well could go. So my, um, when I got to graduate school, one of the first uh, papers that I read uh, uh, when I was sort of cutting my teeth was a recent paper by um, uh, Al Rizzi on uh, uh, active uh, state estimation, but also got to see his amazing juggling robot, which I hope we'll get to see some videos of later today, juggling two ping pong balls uh, on a paddle like this. And it was a little harder, though, because what you'll notice I'm doing is I'm grabbing the balls each time with my hands, and I'm able to regulate the phase because of the incredible affordance I have over its phase during the time that the balls are in my hand. But Al had to solve a much harder problem, and so did you know, the people before him, like Martin Bueller. Um, and he had to do something more like, <laughs> <laughs> like that, where your affordance over phase is much weaker because you have to do it based on the height of the balls. Um, and so. Uh, that really intrigued me. Uh, uh, I also began to learn about uh, phase regulation from people like um, um, uh, uh, Eric Clavens uh, and, and many others out of Dan's lab and trying to really understand how phase is regulated from a synthetic point of view. Well, uh, closed the loop many years later and I had the opportunity to work on a problem with um, my PhD students well, here, here I was back as a kid. Um, you know, when I first got to Dan's lab and I saw this machine of owls, I just thought, this is incredible. And um, I was sure that I was going to be on The Tonight Show passing clubs with a, with a new enhanced version of the robot that I made. But unfortunately, I failed. Uh, and instead, uh, my students do things like try to figure out how now humans regulate phase. And so here's a little haptic 
system that my students built to try to study how we use feedback from timing in order to regulate something like ball juggling. I can do one, but not two, like Al's machine could do for like five hours. Um, uh, and uh, so we, we looked at how timing is used, uh, uh, timing feedback in the form of haptic feedback in humans is used to regulate our internal, internal clock. And quite stupidly, like you'd think he would have gotten this all through my head about the importance of phase regulation, we did a follow-on study where we looked at, um, this is work, the first was work by Merit Ankarala, and the second here is work by, by Robert Nickel. Um, we, we did perturbations of both the visual percept of, how, of where the ball was, as well as the timing percept of when the ball hit the hand. And I thought, well, if I was an engineer, I had a really good clock, and the ball arrived a little bit late, I would infer that the ball must have been too high. I'd, I'd improve my state estimate of the ball. But we found, quite obviously in hindsight, and I'm sorry you didn't get through my head and so I would have had the right hypothesis to begin with, that instead what you do is you ascribe the error in timing to an error in your own kernel, internal clock and you, and you reset your, the phase of your internal oscillator. So somehow you tried and failed to teach me these things, but at least the ideas were there so when I realized what I was doing wrong, I could figure it out. Um, and so uh, that was a really uh, fun study and it, it allowed me to kind of close a, a feedback loop uh, between my love of juggling as a kid, the expansion that took place uh, in my brain about all the different ways, you know, th this was probably the unique lab in the world that could give me the tool set to understand this from a synthesis point of view, a control point of view, and a neural analysis point of view. I don't think, I can't imagine having landed in a, in a lab where where the ability to understand something like the control of a dynamical system as complex as juggling um, uh, you know, could have uh, provided me the insights that your lab provided and, and, and continues to provide uh, in this, uh, to this day on so many different areas. So um, these are just some of the, the take homes, but I just say that the key was that the biological clock um, regula regulates itself to the mechanics, just like uh, Dan's and his colleagues, seminal work, have, have taught us. Um, so I got to close the loop, uh, and uh, this is the cover uh, article of a journal of neurophysiology, and that's my graduate school uh, juggling partner. I, when I, we got in the journal, I emailed him and said, hey, do you want to be on the cover of a magazine? He's like, oh, that sounds cool. <laughs> um, so he's actually a professional juggler, um, so I got to roll in some high circles in the juggling world, let me tell you. Um, and uh, I want to be mindful of time since I am the arbiter. I think I have four minutes left. So I want to tell you about one other uh, project, uh, just briefly, that uh, has come forward to this day and has now provided a framework for me to again begin to collaborate with, with Dan. And uh, you know, it started you know, from this famous paper of Al's that I read as a graduate student thinking about state estimation to building a state estimation of a cognitive variable in the brain and then ultimately closing a loop around that cognitive variable. And so um, let me just explain it all on this one slide. So we have this experiment where we have rats running around in circles uh, in a planetarium style dome that's about two meters in diameter. And as they're going around in that space, we can read out in real time, and I say we, I mean the amazing efforts of my collaborator Jim Kinnearum and our, and our shared graduate students and postdocs can read out a set of simultaneously recorded neurons uh, from an area of the brain called the hippocampus. And using that, we can estimate how fast the animal thinks it's moving in its cognitive map. And so as the animal's running along in this little circle, it's seeing these stripes on the wall. And in this particular experiment, we've made the rat not able to see landmarks or any other thing that would give it a piece of polarizing information that would establish its position in a, in a ground truth reference frame. So what happens is it's positional map begins to drift. It stays coherent. That's one of the exciting things that we can show. It stays coherent. The population of neurons does have a, a good state estimate going on of its position in, the, in, in an environment, but that, envir that estimate is no longer anchored by the landmarks to a, to a ground truth reference frame. Well, we wanted to understand how the different s signals that are coming up into the nervous system inter integrate and form that coherent percept and can they mutually adjust each other, sort of fine tune each other on the fly. And so we did an experiment where we estimate the brain's gain in real time, that's beautiful work by my student uh, Ravi Jayakumar, and then run that, so with a simple model, we were able to realize that a very simple integral control law would be enough to, should be enough based on our model, 
And one of the things I learned from Dan is if you have a theorem and the system doesn't work, you know you made some assumptions that were uh, too um, um, uh, grossly violated, but it did work most of the time, where an integral control law that adjusts the gain on the stripes, that is how fast do the stripes move in relation to the animal's movement, and we were able to regulate the animal's internal estimate of its own speed to a constant value. So we could make the animal think that it was going twice as fast as it really was, or 50% faster than it really was, for a sustained period of time. And then we did a really fun trick. We then turn off the stripes and listen in on the hippocampus, and it has recalibrated its path integrator. And it's not getting stripe information anymore, so it's recalibrated the path integration based on the other inputs to the brain, like step counting, we, you might call it simply, or proprioception, uh, and uh, vestibular information. So there's sort of a mutual recalibration of uh, these inputs to the hippocampus. And by the way, Jim's got me thinking now, Jim Kinnear's got me thinking now that the hippocampus is really just a glorified central pattern generator of sorts. And so you can start to think about these kind of inputs as sort of feeding into a coupled oscillator dynamical system. Um, and so we're back to sort of regulating and understanding uh, phase. So with that, um, uh, I guess I can't not just make sure that at least you enjoyed some of this. So um, I'll show my last e effort to regulate phase. And unfortunately, I'm not calibrated with my glasses on or off. I'm not sure which is better. So, oh, oh, here. There, there we go. I can do that without my glasses on. And I'm going to do a little bit of sequential composition. Oh. I, I learned all about air recovery from Rob Burridge's work. Uh, <laughs> All right, this is, I didn't practice this on the train, unfortunately. I got to oh wait, then there's also this kind of air recovery. All right. Thank you, Dan, for everything you taught me. And, um, and not to be a hypocrite, I want to keep the trains on time and pass the baton to Lewis.